Now we're coming towards the end of surface area. We've looked at lots of different kinds of shapes. Think back to last week. What was the first kind of, the simplest kind of shape that we worked out the surface area of? Hands up, does anyone remember? Prisms, okay, I heard it, very good. We went from prisms, which had a similar cross section all the way through, to another one that started with P. Pyramids, very good, which don't have the same cross section. They have a base, and then it all obviously comes up to the point. We did prisms, we did pyramids. Yesterday, we looked at two kinds of shapes. We looked at spheres and cones. I suppose you could think of a cone, kind of like a special pyramid, right? Yeah. That's where we left off. Yeah. Composite solids take all those ideas and roll them into one. Because does anyone know what composite means? Composite. Delage, what do you think? Shapes are joined together like certain shapes. Yeah, very good. It's whenever you combine things of any kind. Like, for example, you can have um, composite materials like uh, polyester. It's made of like plastic and cotton mixed together. When we're talking about composite solids, maybe you want to draw one of these next to um, where you've got your working here. It only has to be small. Things like, say, this. Here's, um, actually, I drew it upside down. Uh, here's an ice cream cone, right? So you've got the uh, you've got the waffle there, and then you've got the ice cream. This is a cone and a uh, hemisphere put together, yeah. Why aren't we doing a practical example? Yes, why aren't we doing a practical example? Uh, work, uh, work health and safety and allergy safety. That's that's why I'm not doing anything. So here's, here's an example. Two solids you already know how to find the surface area of, jam it together. Um, you can do this with anything, for example, if we took a cube, a simple cube, right? A way I could turn this into a composite solid is not by adding something on, but I could take something away. For instance, if I punched a hole in here, right? There was a triangular prism all the way through. Can you picture it? Can you imagine a block, right? And then someone is chiseled all the way through. So you have this hole going right down the middle that is in the shape of a triangle. Okay. So in each of these, I want to give you three principles that will help you with all kinds of composite solids like this. And then I'll come back to these two specific shapes. Okay. So here are my three principles. And they kind of overlap with things you've already done. Number one. You're dealing with shapes, right? And there are pictures. You might be provided with a picture, you might not. There might be a verbal description. Whatever the case is, the first thing you should always do is draw diagrams. Okay? Now, I'll add on to something uh, once you've got the diagram there, but this is so important. Like I said, even when you've been provided a diagram, the reason it's so important to draw is because when you write and when you draw as a mathematician, okay, um, you do that for two main reasons. The first one is, like over here, have a look at this. Right? The first one is you want to present your mathematical thinking to someone else. Right? It's like stuff's in my head, I want to get it out of my head and into yours. That's what writing and drawing helps us do. Now that I've got this, you're like, oh, that's the picture from my mind to yours. So you're communicating. But in addition to that, we write and we draw not just to communicate mathematical thought, but to construct it. Have a look at this first equation that you got, right? I cannot solve that in my head. I just can't do it, right? Even if you give me lots and lots of time, if all I've got is my brain, I know I might be able to get through here, but I don't think I get the right answer. So we don't just communicate mathematical thought through writing and drawing. We actually construct mathematical thought by writing and drawing. As you draw this, you understand the shape. The act of drawing helps you understand the shape. So once you've drawn it, there are a few things we're going to include on there in addition to just the diagram. Okay? I would encourage you to add, do you remember on that pyramid we were working out just now? <coughs> Excuse me, to do the surface area, I added on extra lines. We call them constructions. Far more easy to add constructions when you've got a thing on a piece of paper rather than in your head. <clears throat> on your head. And then when you have constructions, usually you need to know like lengths or angles or whatever it is. So we call them measurements. So your diagrams, they serve a purpose. 
They help you add stuff on and also know what numbers are where. Now, secondly, uh, just have a look at, say, this guy here. Right? Do you remember a couple of days ago I asked you about this weird cross-shaped prism? And I said, hey, how many faces are there? Right? That was the question I posed. Right? How many faces are on this? Now, it's a rhetorical question. I just want you to think about it. But do you notice, as you count them through, I count six that would be on the cube on the outside, but then as I've punched through and added a few more, I think I count nine. Yeah, do you agree? Okay. Yeah. Now, as you've got those in your head and then are communicating what those surface areas are, you've got to be able to talk about what's what. Top, bottom, side, inside, etc. Okay. So therefore, on your diagram, you should name or label... What do we call those things that I was working on? The faces, right? Because that enables you to actually talk about what they are and have them in your working, rather than just like a series of equations that may give you the right number, but I don't know what they're talking about. I don't know what they're referring to. So name or label the faces and do it on your diagram. Do something like, if you've drawn this, you know, top, bottom, front, uh, inside. Sometimes it's a bit tricky. You might have lots of different things, and like I don't, I've run out of words. Maybe you just number the faces: side, uh, face one, two, three, four. Whatever you need to, so that there's an unambiguous way to refer to them. Okay. Um, you know the faces inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the answer to your specific one, I would assume, is yes. When we say surface area, when we say surface area, we literally mean the entire surface. So if you've got a cup, right, can you picture a cup in your mind, right? The inside where you pour water, that is part of the surface of the cup, so it would be included. Which is why if it's closed, well, the surface is just the outside part, which is why you don't worry about the end bit, okay? Here, it's just a hole, so in this case, I'd include it. Okay, lastly, and it's just sort of feeding off of this second principle, once you've labeled those faces, you should identify those faces in all of those equations and calculations that you're doing down here. Okay, See all of this stuff? This may all be numerically correct, but I don't really know what any of it refers to. Like, what is 4,860? What does it signify? Uh, I'm guessing now... It's the four triangular faces. Uh, by looking at that and trying to work it out, I think that's what's going on. Okay? So tell me, that's what you're doing. Communicate clearly. So identify the faces in your work. Okay? So before we actually do an example together, so maybe if you haven't already, open up your laptops and load up to exercise 405. As you're doing that, can I just get you to have one eye as well on this working? I've only just noticed this because I talked about it. Um, see this slide here? The one where I said, oh look, you've got a pyramid and there's four triangular faces. Okay. 4,860 may well be the correct number as you all agreed with that number. However, just be really, really careful. As you're opening it, please look at what I'm about to write on the board. Just look carefully. I wonder if you can follow the train of thought. I've practiced this for years, which is why I know what's going on. But that line actually has a really big problem with it. I think, if I'm reading this correctly, I think a half times 45 times 54, I think that's 1,215. Uh, you can go ahead and you can check for me. Okay. Now, then this happens. Now, can you tell me why, right or wrong, can you tell me why this appears? Yeah, no triangles. Very good. You're like, I worked out one triangle, but actually I've got four of them. Okay? So that's why you end up with the right number, 4,860. So can anyone tell me why it's a problem to write it like this? Or if? Correct. It's that guy right there. When you say something equals something else, <coughs> you really mean they are identical in every way in their values and in their magnitude, etc. And once we put this in, they're no longer equal. A half times 45 times 54 is not this number. Okay. Now you want this number, but if you want that, maybe you should say, I've got four triangles to begin with, and then everything is actually equal. Okay? So just a minor note.